John, our pastor John, started the Gospel of John and started talking about John the Baptist, a lot of Johns, uh, a couple weeks ago. And he spent two weeks developing the first uh, 14, 18 verses here in John's Gospel. But just a reminder, this Gospel is written so that you may know, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. John states that in John chapter 20, verse 31. It, it's his summary statement of what the Gospel of John is written for. And that's why we recommend for newer believers and even unbelievers, read the Gospel of John so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing in his name, you will have life. That's new life, everlasting life, resurrection life. And so that's the purpose of this gospel. So keeping that in mind, here in chapter 1, really, John's developing that theme that he's going to expound upon as we go through the rest of the gospel of John. And so just a quick summary, because it's been two weeks now since we've been in the gospel of John, just remembering the things we've learned thus far. We've learned that Jesus is God, right? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And all things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. He is the creator, he is God, and the word became flesh, verse 14, and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So, so here is Jesus, who is in fact God. He's the word, he is God, and he became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus left his holy habitation in heaven. And he came down. God himself came down from heaven and came to us so that we could come to him. He came to us so we could come to him. And if he didn't come, we would not or could not come to him because otherwise there'd be no other way. Jesus said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, and I'm the life. And he is the exact representation of God the Father. Look at verse 18. It says, no one has seen God at any time. You remember Moses said, uh, said, said to, to the Lord, show me your glory. And he said, well, can't see me and live. <laughs> so I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll, I'll put you in the cleft of the rock. I'll put my hand over you. I'll pass by and I'll just show you my backside, you know, my my Shekinah or Shekinah glory. That's all you'd be able to see and live. But no one has ever seen God at any time, verse 18. The only begotten Son, though, who is in the bosom, who is near to his heart, he has declared him or revealed him or made him known. In other words, if you look at Jesus, you're looking at God. If you're looking at Jesus, it says in Colossians chapter 2, Verse 9, that in him, in Christ, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you're complete in him. If you look at Jesus, you're looking at God. He is the exact representation. He would say later on in, to, to, to Philip, right, in John chapter 14, Philip said, just show us the Father, and that would be sufficient for us. And he said, Philip, I've been, to, been with you so long. Don't you know me? If you've seen me, you have seen the Father. In John chapter 10, verse 30, Jesus said, I and the Father are one. These are all verses from the Gospel of John, by the way. Interesting. That's why we tell you to read the Gospel of John as a new believer, because you will believe that Jesus is the Christ, and in him find life. And so Jesus is the fullness of the Godhead. When you look at Jesus, you're looking at all that God is. And that's why we read the Bible. Because this is the written word that tells us about Jesus, the living word. And as we read God's word, we're looking at him page after page after page so that we could know him. And when we know him, we discover how much he loves us. And we love him because... He first loved us, right? He, he started the whole thing. He's the initiator. And we're the responders. 
And so he came to us. Emmanuel, God with us, right? Christmas is right around the corner. We're going to have all this stuff on our Christmas cards real soon. Emmanuel, God with us. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. We're going to have all these things. And we love to quote them and read them and we're on our cards and everything else. But think about that. Here's God who came into the world, the full expression of all that God is. And it says in verse 10 of John chapter 1, He was in the world and the world was made through Him and the world didn't know Him. John made the comment a couple weeks ago that everything, all of creation, because Jesus created everything, He spoke everything to existence from nothing. And yet, although He created everything, He came into His world, His creation, and the world didn't know him. Not surprising, though. We're told in Romans chapter 3 that no one seeks after God. No, not one. We all sin. We all fall short of the glory of God. It's interesting. Everything else in creation, except for mankind who was created in God's image, obeys him. Except for us, we're created in God's image. We also have the ability to reason and to think, and we have free will. And many times... We just choose to go our own way. Enter Jesus Christ. Knowing all this, he came so that we could come to him. Jesus would say, no one comes to me lest the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. John chapter 6, verse 44. And so Jesus is the full embodiment. He comes into the world. His, the world does not know him. He came to his own creation and his own people verse 11, did not receive him. His own chosen people, Israel, did not receive him. How tragic. But, but is a hinge word because in verse 12 it says, to those, to as many as received him, he gave them the right, that's the authority actually, to become children of God to those who believe in his name. And so you must believe and receive Christ personally if you want to have a relationship with Christ and relationship with God himself. See, if you want to be a child of God, you must believe and you must receive. I'm emphasizing that because it's an individual choice. Nobody can do it for you, right? Look at verse 13. It says, uh, you know, who were born not of blood. Oh, I was born in a Christian home. My grandfather was a pastor. Not going to get you in. Or, or, or of the will of man. You can't be born of the will of man. I'm going to try really, 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 really hard to be a good person and, I, and, and I'll get in. That's not going to get you in. Or by the will of man. I have people in my life that I love dearly. Family members that I've shared the gospel with many times. But I can't push him, I can't force him, I can't coerce him, and I can't talk him into it. I've tried. <laughs> you can't do it. Right? Jesus said, no one comes to me lest the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. But Jesus came to us. Right? Emmanuel, God with us so that we could have everlasting life. So there's a quick recap. <laughs> now I want to talk about today <clears throat> John's testimony, John the Baptist's testimony. And so in verse 6, there was a man sent from God. His name was John, John the Baptist, of course. This man came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all through him might believe. He was not the light, but he was sent to bear witness of the light. And so John was sent to be a witness. We are sent to be a witness just like John. Same thing. John had a special calling on his life. We're going to look at that in a minute because I want to look at the testimony of John beginning in verse 19 in just a moment. But we're sent just like John. As a matter of fact, let me, let me make this statement here. The only reason as born-again believers we're still here on planet Earth is to go into all the world and preach the gospel, be witnesses for Christ. It's the only reason we're still here. Otherwise, God would just save us and take us home. But we're here to do his work. Right? We're here to complete the mission that Jesus started. Right? 
of preaching the gospel. And, and it's, it's peculiar, I agree, but he takes us and he uses us to tell others about Christ. I mean, those Billy Graham crusades and Franklin Graham crusades and great glory and all, those are great. And I thank God that he has raised up people like that that are evangelists to preach the gospel with clarity, power, and boldness that many people get saved at these events. And as wonderful as they are, it's the one-on-one. It's the one-on-one sharing the good news, one-on-one, being a witness. What's a witness? It's simply telling what I've seen, what I've heard, what I know, what God did in my life. We all have, we're all witnesses. And, and Jesus said in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you receive power to be my witnesses. And so we're all called. We're all sent by God, just like John, to be a witness. And it says in verse 19, now this is the testimony of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? So, so here's the scene. Here's what's happening. Now, um, uh, John is out baptizing in the wilderness. You see this in Matthew chapter 3, Mark chapter 1, and Luke chapter 3. It's not named here in in John's gospel, but the other three have it in there. He's out in the wilderness beyond the Jordan, and he's baptizing, and multitudes are coming out to him to be baptized. This is creating quite a stir, as you could imagine, and the religious leaders, they, they hear this is happening. John didn't go to confer with the religious leaders. Isn't that interesting? He had a direct call from God, and he's doing what God called him to do. He didn't go have a sit down with them and say, hey, just want to let you know, you know, I'm John the Baptist, you know, I got this his funky clothes, you know, camel's hair and the belt and the locusts and all this kind of stuff. And I, I got this calling from God. And I'm like, is that okay with you guys? He didn't do that. He's just operating in the calling and ministry that God gave him. And so the Jewish leaders, they hear about it. So they send, uh, you know, some, some people, right? Priests and Levites uh, from Jerusalem to go and ask him, just who are you anyway? Because, you know, you didn't run this by us. You know, who gave you the authority anyway kind of a thing? Who are you? And so he confessed in verse 20 and did not deny but confessed, 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 kind of emphatic, I am not the Christ. John made it very clear. Notice, he didn't say who he was. He said who he wasn't. I'm not the Christ. He knows, first of all, he just wants to get that out of the way. I'm not him. So, you know, don't be looking at me. I'm not him, which is just indicative of John's ministry anyway, pointing to Christ. Not me. I'm not the Christ. John's a guy who knew who he was and who he was not. He doesn't tell them who he is. He, tell them, he tells them who he is not. And I like this because it, it, it just, it's right out of the gate. You see, this is John, John's self-aware guy. He knows what he's called to do. He's a voice. He's a voice, but he's not the Christ. I'm not the Christ. And I point that out because we know we're not the Christ. If we're believers in Christ, we still know we're not the Christ. Or at least I hope we do anyway. But sometimes we act like we're Christ, you know. Uh, we, we, we handle the affairs of our life sometimes on our own. We go our own way. We do our own thing. Our family, our kids, our decisions, our work, and Sometimes we do things like that. And we would never say, I'm the Christ, but we act like we're the Christ sometimes. John's a self-aware guy. He knows who he is. And he knows who he's not. I'm not the Christ. They said, well, verse 21, then what then? Are you Elijah? Now, of course, John is not Elijah. And he said, no, I am not. However, in Luke chapter 1, you know, when, when, when Zacharias, the angel appeared to him and and he told him that even though his wife has been barren, she's going to give birth to John, right? Uh, you know, he was told by that angel that John would come in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord. And John didn't say any of those things. He just said, no, I'm not Elijah either. He, the guy doesn't want to talk about himself. He wants to point elsewhere. Don't look at me. It's not about me. I love that. 
And then they said, well, well, then who are you, the prophet? Are you the prophet? Which is a reference to Deuteronomy 18, 15, the prophet who is to come. Moses said, the Lord will raise up a prophet like me from within your brethren, from, from the nation of Israel, and him you will hear. And John says, no, I'm not him either. By the way, that ultimately would be Jesus, right? I'm not him either. And then they said to him, verse 22, well then, who are you that we may give an answer to those who sent us? What do you say about yourself, John? And he said, finally, they kept pressing him and pressing him. Now he's, he's forced to say something about himself. He says, I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Quoting from Isaiah chapter 40, he's letting them know, okay, you want to know who I am? This is who I am. I'm just a voice. I'm the guy who's called to make straight, or to, to warn people. He's coming. Make straight the way of the Lord. But I'm just a voice. John's ministry was preparing people for the coming of the Lord. Now, it says in verse 24, those who were sent from the Pharisees, or those who were sent were sent from the Pharisees, and they asked him, saying, well, why then do you baptize if you're not the Christ, Elijah, or the prophet? Why do you baptize? Good question. Why do you baptize? Well, John's baptism was typically, or baptism in those days, rather, was typically reserved uh, for, I mean, Jews practiced baptism, but only for those who wanted to convert to Judaism, Gentiles who wanted to convert to Judaism. And so John's baptism was uh, a different than that, but I don't want, you know, I don't want there to be any confusion. In a minute, I'll talk about what our baptism is about. But John's baptism, baptism was uh, simply to get cleaned up and get prepared. And so they say, why do you baptize then if you're not the Christ or Elijah or the prophet? And John answered saying, I baptize with water, but there stands one among, whom, among you whom you do not know. He still doesn't really answer their question. Why are you baptizing? But see, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. That's why he's, bap he's baptizing. Repent, right? For the kingdom or the, 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 the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's really close. It's a baptism of repentance. Get ready. Repent. Turn from your sin. Get cleaned up and get ready. Not to be confused with the baptism that we practice today. We just did a baptism a couple months ago in August. And I call that I like to call that believer's baptism because it's for believers only. See, baptism follows a profession of faith. Once you have made a profession of faith in Jesus Christ and have received the free gift of salvation, the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of you and your spirit is quickened. You're born again. And so baptism follows that decision. Baptism doesn't save you, but baptism follows that decision. Baptism is actually, believer's baptism that we practice today, is actually a, a public proclamation of identification with Jesus Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. I'm standing up before God and all who see to say, I stand with Jesus Christ. I belong to him. And this is what happened inside of me. When I received Christ as my Lord and Savior, I died to myself. And so, so we practice full submersion, in case you've never been to one of our baptisms, and we go down on the water, signifying I'm dead and buried. We come up out of the water, new life, resurrection life. This is what happened inside of me when I was born. I became a new creation. Old things passed away. Behold, all things become new. It's a public proclamation. It's more than just a picture or a symbol. It's taking a public stand. That's believer's baptism. This is something different that John's doing. It's a baptism of preparation. Repent. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Really close because the Messiah has come, as we're going to see in a moment. And so John says, I baptize with water, but there's one that stands among you whom you do not know. It is he who, coming after me, is preferred before me, in other words, ranks higher than I, whose sandal strap I am not even worthy 
to loose. And these things were done in Bethany beyond the Jordan where John was baptizing. And so John makes this statement. He says, this one who's coming, he, is, he ranks higher than I. He's greater than I. He's much greater than I. So much so that I'm not even worthy to untie his sandal strap. What does that mean? Well, it means simply this, that in, the, in that day, the custom was when guests came into your house, the lowest slave in the house would take the sandals off of your feet and wash your feet. And John's saying, I'm not even worthy to do that. All right? Compared to, to, to this guy, Christ, I'm nobody. I'm nobody. See, John's continually, I must decrease. He must increase. John chapter 3. Well, John will get there. Pastor John will get there. <laughs> A lot of Johns. Pastor John will get there uh, and expound upon that when he gets into chapter 3. But John said, he must increase and I must decrease. That's John pointing. Don't look at me. Look at Christ. If you look at me, I hope you see Christ in me. But don't look at me. Look at Christ. As a matter of fact, in 1 Peter chapter 5, I'm sure you're familiar with the passage. It said, God's re- God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. John was a humble man. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, and he will exalt you in due time. He will raise you up in due time. The way up is down. If you want to be exalted, you know, then humble yourself. If you, wanna, if you want God to raise you up and use you greatly, then realize it's not about you. It's not that you're insignificant. And I'm, uh, John is kind of saying, you know, I'm nobody because it's not about me. We have great value and worth. We actually, Ephesians chapter 1 tells us that to God we are an inheritance to him. We're created for his good pleasure. We have great value to God, but it's not about us. It's about him. That's why we sang that song, Holy, holy is the lamb who was slain. Holy, holy is he. Right? He's the one. That's, why, that's what we'll be doing in heaven, <laughs> praising and praising and praising God. It's all about him. It's all about Jesus. John understood that. John was a humble man. Matter of fact, Jesus would say in Luke chapter 14, verse 11, if you exalt yourself, you'll be humbled. But if you humble yourself, you'll be exalted. Right? <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> and so John is a humble guy. And, and, and really, as people walk with the Lord for a while, this, indicative, this is indicative of anybody who God really uses. God raises up the man who is humble. He'll exalt you in due time. Sometimes it takes a little while, but God raises up. God exalts. If you want to have authority, you come under his authority, and he will raise you up. That's John. It's interesting, you know, uh, one of the traits of, of a humble person, a humble man, is that they just serve the Lord. They just serve the Lord. They're not looking for accolades. They're just serving the Lord. And other people see how God is using them greatly, but they, they don't even think about that. They're just serving the Lord. Matter of fact, later on in Matthew chapter 11, once John was already in prison, Jesus said this about John. He said, among those born of women, there is none greater than John the Baptist. Why? Well, He was the last of the Old Testament prophets who was the one who had the privilege of saying, make straight the way of the Lord, you know, pronouncing he's coming. Here comes the Lord. But John just said, I'm not even worthy to untie this trap. Don't look at me. Look at him. I must decrease and he must increase. Less of me and more of him. Or how about none of me and all of him? Right? Ultimately, that's where we want to be. John's a great example of that. And so the next day, verse 29, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, and I love this statement, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. 
Man, what a great summary statement about Jesus Christ. I think that's the ultimate summary statement. Behold, he's the Lamb of God who came to take away the sin of the world. And that's exactly what he came to do. He's God's sacrificial lamb who came as the final sacrifice to take away, not cover, but take away the sin of the world. You remember uh, in Genesis chapter 22, God told Abraham to sacrifice his only son, Isaac. And, And so Abraham, in obedience, he's climbing Mount Moriah. And of course, this is a picture of God who would sacrifice his only son one day for the sins of the world. But he climbs Mount Moriah in obedience, and Isaac is with him, his only son. And on the way up the mountain, Isaac says, "Uh, so Father, I see here we have the fire and we got the wood. Uh, Where's the lamb for sacrifice? (laughs) And Abraham says, my son, God will provide the sacrifice, which he did, by the way, because as he was about to sacrifice his only son, like God told him, God stopped him. And he said, now I know you believe in me. And there was a ram caught in the thicket and he became the sacrifice. But ultimately, the question is, where's the lamb? Just like Isaac said, where's the lamb? Here he is. Behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The lamb has come. Emmanuel, God with us. He came down from heaven. He's now with us. Here's the Lamb of God. And John makes this wonderful proclamation. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The Jews would understand this. And because God instituted the sacrificial system, they know, they understand really well that you know, somebody, something's got to die to pay for the sin. Something's got to die, right? Morning and evening, morning and evening were the sacrifices. Had to continually sacrifice because they continually sinned. Morning and evening, because these sacrifices could only cover, not take away sin, not like the Lamb of God. So they would understand this. They were steeped in it. It was ingrained in them. They also understood that without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. They understood that too. As a matter of fact, in Hebrews chapter 10. Let me just read this to you. It says this, uh, speaking of the the priests in, in the day during the sacrificial system, it says, and every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, speaking of Jesus, after he had offered the sacrifice once for sins forever, He sat down at the right hand of God till his enemies were made his footstool. Morning and evening, morning and evening, the sacrifices were made, but they could only cover, not take away sin. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He's God's Passover Lamb. Not only did he die on Passover, and Jesus did die on Passover, but he was the Passover lamb. You remember the Passover when the, uh, the, the, Israelite, the Israelites were free from bondage and slavery in Egypt. And God told them to take a, for every household, to take a lamb, sacrifice the lamb, put the blood on the doorpost and on the lintel, and the destroyer would come to destroy all the firstborn in Egypt, but not the house of Israel with the blood over the doorpost and the lintel. I will pass over that house. And that was their salvation. Right? And then God instituted that as a Passover festival or feast, a yearly feast. He's the Passover lamb. He's the lamb who was led to slaughter in Isaiah 53, that prophetic passage that talks about God's only son who would be cut off from the land of the living and it pleased God to bruise him. He's the Passover lamb. He's the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so John rightly points him out and says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away, doesn't cover, but takes away the sin of the world. That's why Jesus said on the cross, It is finished. No more sacrifices. Right? And and so today, we have the finished work of the cross. And we can come to Jesus and receive him freely. Have our sins not covered, but taken away. Once for all, one sacrifice for all. John says, this is whom 
I said, after me comes a man who is preferred before me, for, for he was before me, which is interesting because John's six months older than Jesus. He was actually before him, but he's speaking of the Jesus is eternal. He's God. And he says in verse 31, I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore, I came baptizing with water. And John bore witness saying, I saw the spirit descending from heaven like a dove and he remained upon him. And I didn't know him, even though he's my cousin. I didn't know he was the Lamb of God. I didn't know he was Messiah. I didn't know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes not with water, but with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and testified, John says. I testify. This is the Son of God. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. When did John see the Holy Spirit coming down upon him? What? Right, when he came up out of the water. When John baptized him and, and he came up out of the water and here's a voice from heaven. This is my son in whom I am well pleased. Here's the Holy Spirit descending upon him and remaining upon him. That was the beginning of Jesus' public ministry, by the way. And then, of course, there's Jesus. So you've got God the Father speaking. You've got Jesus being baptized and the Holy Spirit coming down upon him. Perfect picture of the Trinity working in perfect harmony. Beautiful picture. And so Jesus was baptized that day with the Holy Spirit himself. And the Holy Spirit came upon him later on after he would be led by the Spirit now, baptized, overtaken by the Spirit. He would be led into the wilderness where he would be tempted by Satan. And then he came out of there and he went into Nazareth, his hometown. And on the Sabbath, he went into the synagogue and he was handed the scroll. And he opened the scroll, Isaiah. And he read, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. And he has anointed me. I'm the Messiah, which means the anointed one. He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to set at liberty the captives, to preach, the, to preach the good news to the blind, to open their eyes, to preach the acceptable day of the Lord. And he closed the scroll and everybody was looking at him and he said, today these scriptures are fulfilled in your hearing. Wow. Right? And they said, but this is the carpenter's son, Joseph. What's the deal? And, and he couldn't even do any miracles there. But that was the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. The Holy Spirit came upon him, which is very interesting because he, was, he received power that day. He's fully God, remember, and fully man. But he did set aside his divine prerogatives in Philippians chapter 2. And he received power to go out and do what he did. On earth, that is. Very interesting. But see... He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And this filling of the Spirit, this, this free gift of salvation, being born again of the Spirit. John chapter 3, Jesus is going to say, if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must be born again. This is available to everybody who believes and receives, and then they have the right to become a child of God, adopted into the family of God, Ephesians chapter 1. And so here's the question as we close. Have you believed? And have you received? Have you believed? Not, I grew up in a Christian home. Not, I'm a good person. But have you personally just believed in the name of Jesus Christ? And have you received the free gift of salvation from him? Is that like any gift? In order to give a gift to somebody, it only works if the somebody receives it. If they don't receive it, it the transaction can't be completed. Have you believed? It, it says in Romans chapter 10, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. The most definitive verse in all the Bible. And then the next verse says, for with the heart one believes, and with the mouth confession is made. With the heart one believes. Right? In my heart, I believe. Jesus is.
the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And when I believe, then I come to him and I receive the gift. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. I believe that. Forgive me for my sins. Thank you for rising again from the dead so that I could have new life, everlasting life. I ask you to be my Savior and my Lord. If you haven't done that, listen, God loves you so much. He loves you so much that while you are far away from him, he died on the cross for your sins. He sent his only begotten son, God in the flesh, Emmanuel, came to the cross. Imagine this. Here is God himself coming into the world, living for us as a servant, and then dying for us on the cross. Could, could you make a, 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 a more uh, firm statement of how much I love my creation than to die on the cross for them? And he died for you and he died for me. He died for the sin of the world. It says in Isaiah 59, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor his ear that he, too heavy that he cannot hear, but your iniquities have separated you from God and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. You see, sin's the problem. Sin separates. But Jesus Christ came to take sin away so that you could be reconciled. And so if you're here today and you have not received the free gift of salvation, this is a, your golden opportunity today to receive him. Or if you're here today and you say, you know, I, was, I grew up in a Christian home and I went to church, but I don't know if I've ever received him. If you don't know, then you haven't received him. Because <laughs> if you did, you know it. Right? Or... If you made a profession of faith somewhere along the line, but you're not really walking the walk and you know it. Maybe you never walked the walk. Maybe you started to and you, you just fell away. Whatever the case may be, today's the day of salvation. Come forward. Don't let the enemy tell you otherwise because he wants to keep you from coming to Christ. There'll be prayer partners up here in just a moment. I'm going to invite the band to come back up now and, and lead us in our last song as I pray. But look, come, and, come and up to the, one of the prayer partners or, or come talk to me. <laughs> I'd love to talk to you more about this and lead you in a prayer to receive Christ. Let's pray together.